The fun headline of business continuity. My own history is I have been working in a company that was solely working on business continuity. So if I wanted, I could easily cover the next hour with horror stories on business continuity with, uh, well, just the definition of business continuity in and of itself. But we'll just, well, I'll try to content myself and rather go quickly through it as it's an abstract preparation for us actually clustering LifeRay. One of my pet peeves, and I'll get to that later, is also maintaining backups. Now, I will repeat this in the chapter when we actually talk about backups, is I have a very specific opinion about backups and what anybody is allowed to call a backup. Has anybody heard that before? I'm quite vocal about that. My opinion is you are only allowed to call something a backup if you have recently demonstrated that you're able to use this something to restore a fully functioning system to some environment that has never seen LifeRay before, then you're allowed to call it backup. Otherwise, you're allowed to call it some copy of the data that you intend to maybe use to your advantage sometime later. And as nobody wants to call it that, if you want to call it backup, make sure to make some tests. It's not a matter of whether or not you should have a backup, but if you can recover, restore after any failure and how quickly. So just remember, if you can restore, then you have probably recently demonstrated. And if you can't, then you're not allowed to call it a backup. You just don't have a backup. We can talk a bit more about the backups, uh, what you need, facility, connectivity, network infrastructure, server hardware. I'll leave that to yourself. Uh, if you test, then you will know what you need for your backup. And as I said, test by restoring to a fully new system which has never seen LifeRay before. If that succeeds, everything is fine. Uh, we are talking about hot site uh, or hot backups, warm or cold backups which basically is a function of you, how fast you need your system back up. If you do hot, then you typically have a server running which doesn't do anything but just runs, ready for action. Um, if you have a warm setup, then uh, you can spin something up which has some data already. And if you have a cold backup, then you know how to restore to a new system when you need it. Now there's some pros and cons here. Uh, hot backup is, of course, quickly to be recovered. There's a plus here. Maintenance cost, well, you need a fully running server, just as your production server. So, of course, that's higher cost. Uh, for cold, you don't need the spare server, at least not all the time during production, but uh, it takes a while longer to spin that up to recover your backup. Now, if it does or not, depends on your size. If you restore a 100 megabyte backup, that's quick, that's like instant on today's internet. If you restore a 100 gigabyte backup, that might or might not be quick. Again, another option for you to test. And uh, of course, with warm, you're kind of somewhere in between the fuzzy feeling that, yeah, I did a little bit, but not uh, something to be really hot. I would say you, you judge. Because, well, one of the aspects of business continuity that I've learned in my business continuity times is uh, the time to recovery. How long do you need for your system to recover? It depends. There are some who need their life rate portal within the next 30 minutes on any catastrophic failure. And there are others which could easily live without it for a day. So they would like to have it in the end, but there's nothing catastrophic happening to the business if they are without their, let's say, their intranet for a day, and you can't just apply for a vacation for a day. You can still do that by just telling your boss, hey, can I just stay home tomorrow? Uh, it still works. But if it's an actual business customer-facing portal, then you probably have higher demands on the availability of your portal. Now, in the cluster world, we also talk about active-passive, active-active, 
n plus 1. So how many clusters, how many machines do you actually have active at any single time? And this is something that is important in the DXP world, in the world where uh, you actually license all of your support, all of your servers, where we make a distinction between uh, which server is active, how many servers are active, and how many are just standing by, even though they might be running, but they don't serve any actual traffic. So we have active-active, we have active-passive, we have um, something more. And as it says here, HA clusters will use techniques like disk mirroring, redundant network configurations, SAN, even redundant power inputs, uh, blah, blah, blah. So yes, of course, guess what? We're going to just assume that. You have redundant power in your notebook anyways. You have a battery and you have your power cord. That's enough for us. So. Uh, we will only cover, or I will only cover LifeRay here, and uh, everything else is up to you and to your data center. We have a quick overview of the like, N plus one cluster. If you need N clusters, then you might have one on reserve, which then actually goes in there. You might have a full replacement for your cluster. Uh, could be hot, could be cold, uh, which stands by, and then you switch over the load. When one cluster fails, you switch over the load to the completely new machines. Or you might just have them completely active all the time. And uh, what you can do here is you can configure your load balancer, for example, to just serve from two machines at the time, because that's enough. And when one fails, switch over to the other. And of course, what you see here is only the LifeRay side. We assume a single database, and we don't care if that database is clustered or not. We just need a single point of entry whatever LifeRay saves to the database and then asks for it should be the same. So we'll store an object there, and then we ask for the object, it should be the same. And of course, uh, we can go into the cloud. It's a little bit easier, or actually it's a lot easier to spin up a new server in the cloud than it is in your actual data center. I probably don't need to tell you that. Again, it's 2018 and uh, cloud is all the rage. Uh, there is one aspect though, which is, uh, well, what I've seen, physical proximity of servers. If you book some cloud service somewhere and you spin up a new machine, do you know how close that is to your existing machine? Not often. However, when two servers talk to each other and invalidate their caches, it might be critical to be in close proximity. After all, even though it's 2018, speed of light is still limited. And there's still no advance in making it go faster, unless you go closer. So if the two machines actually really communicate a lot with each other, and if that's only to the database, to the common database, then the closer they are together with the database as well, uh, the faster your answers will be and the faster your uh, validation or invalidation of each other's caches will be. So physical proximity actually can be a factor in your cloud setup. If you don't have any control over it, you might have random experiences. When you spin up two machines, cluster them, and you spin up two other machines and cluster them, they might behave vastly different. And the same works then, additional assistance and services. Uh, let me see. No, actually, I was thinking of something else, but that's uh, if you spin up your two LIFER machines and they are now far away from the database or far away from Elasticsearch, then uh, you'll also have a different experience than if they are very close together. Okay, I don't want to sell you on cloud, but yet another aspect of the cloud is the auto scaling, which is something that we offer in LifeRay, where you can basically license a certain number of servers, but you can say, well, from time to time I have a really high demand. I'm in the US, so let's use the Super Bowl as the example. Whenever you have a Super Bowl advertisement, you don't want to overload your servers uh, just because people are now rushing to your servers and, and actually using your offer or intending to use your offer. And also, you don't want to run the full capacity over the full year just because you have this one advertisement in the middle. Uh, that's kind of the, the best way to illustrate the different demands over the year. And there is an auto-scaling offer that we have that you should just be aware of if you have vastly different uh, load on your servers then you can actually dynamically spin up 
yet another server. And naturally, as we were in the cloud, uh, that works best in the cloud without you having all of the hardware uh, ready to go. Quick review here, uh, we're talking about hot, warm and cold. Uh, hot side, perfect duplicate, well, as perfect as possible uh, of the original site. Warm site has the necessary hardware um, to get up and running. Uh, and the cold site is basically something that first needs to get set up. Um, if you use the clusters, high availability clusters, HA clusters, you minimize your downtime and scaling or auto scaling is the simple process you use to add new server nodes to meet incoming demand. So if you want to make that notes, uh, those nodes in your material, go ahead. Now the next chapter will go into what you actually do to LifeRail.